America, Bonjour, hi Canada, I'm Hugh Hewitt, it is the anniversary of that awful day a year ago, 10-7, when 1,200 Israelis were massacred, more than 4,000 others wounded or injured, 250 kidnapped into Gaza. I will conclude today's show talking with former President Trump on this anniversary, I'm beginning it with Dan Senor, who through his podcast, Call Me Back, has been indispensable for Americans eager to understand what has gone on in Israel and how it is going on. Good morning, Dan. Thank you for getting up very early with me. I know you've dropped a special you. episode of Call the, Thank you. You've got a special episode of Call Me Back. I'll listen to that later. Can I ask you at the very start, uh, a year removed from this massacre, how often do you think about the events of that day vis-a-vis -vis Israel's many responses since then? Uh, every single day, many times throughout the day i uh you know i i've had I, october 7th was a trauma uh i think for me personally and i think for the jewish people collectively and i think you don't you don't learn to live without a trauma i think certain traumas just are with you all the time I lost my father when I was young. That was a trauma that I think about every single day. I can't think of another event. 9-11 for years, I thought about every single day. October 7th, certainly over this past year, I think about every single day. And as I said, many times throughout the day, not only because there's the actual horror of October 7th that is just impossible to fathom, so you just keep thinking about it, but also there have been so many, many traumas since October 7th that were catalyzed by October 7th. And I'm, and I'm talking about both the war against Israel in the Middle East, the seven front war against Israel that was sparked by October 7th. So you're inundated with news every day to remind you of the ongoing trauma. And B, the shocking uh, both wave of anti-Semitism uh, waged against Jews around the world, including here in the United States, and B, even even those not participating in the wave of anti-Semitism, just the general lack of empathy among so many people, so many bystanders, if you will, that you come across in one's daily life, people you deal with, colleagues, peers, uh, people you thought you were working with in various causes who just seem not bothered by what you're going through, what 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 happened to the Jewish people on that day, or or even worse, think there's some kind of nuanced, uh, uh, nuanced framework to think about what happened on October 7th and therefore lack any kind of empathy because they think the issue's more complicated than we would like to think. And so they, they, they're, they're able to kind of disconnect from um, expressing any kind of support or solidarity. So when you add all that up, there's the trauma of October 7th, and then there are the many traumas throughout the past year that I just think most Jews uh, have felt. So the idea that this is, that was one day and then we kind of moved on is just um, couldn't be farther from reality. Uh, Dan, this next question, if it's, uh, if you're uncomfortable with it, just ignore it. You've got two boys. I think they're in mm -hmm. junior high and high school, something like that. High school, yeah. What has been the impact of 10-7 in the subsequent year on them? I think they lived a very charmed life as uh, American Jews living in New York City, growing up here. Um, this was, I realize now we were all living through this, this um, Jewish golden age here in the United States. And what I think I have realized is it's the end of that. Jewish golden age. This past year has been the end of that Jewish golden age. And for them, um, they, I just think they lived a, a very um, comfortable, um, coddled, if you will. I don't mean that in a negative way, but just as Jews, they, there was no, there was no tension in being Jewish living here. It wasn't, it never occurred to them. They go to a Jewish day school. They, um, walk freely around New York City or had walked freely around New York City wearing their Jewish identity on their sleeve, They're very active in the Jewish community. Uh, their whole lives are organized around Jewish life, Jewish communal life, connection to Israel. Um, 
pride in in being a, an American Jew and pride in the in the you know the U.S. Israel relationship. All these things they just assumed were normal, and suddenly all of that feels under siege when you go to a Jewish day school in, in many places in the United States today, like in New York City. On some days now they go to school and, and there are NYPD cars sitting outside the school when they walk into school. Um, you have parents, we don't, but I know many parents who tell their kids, don't wear a yarmulke when you're out in public. Don't wear a, you know, a, a Magen David, a Jewish star on, around your neck. Don't, um, don't, my mother, my mother who's, who lives in Jerusalem, who is visiting us right now, we wanted her to be out of there for a few weeks, given how tense things got. She's 86 years old. So she's staying with us. She always brings gifts. She they're my kids are sports fans so she brings them you know american sports teams but like the the logos and the writing on the t-shirts are in hebrew this is like a thing she's been doing for years this time when she came she refused to bring those because she's concerned about them walking around the streets of new york city wearing a t-shirt that's in hebrew because she thinks that there'll be a threat they my kids ride public transportation new york city subways new york city buses that's not a safe place now for jews i mean jews get hassled harassed attacked. I mean, the ADL just came out with a study over the weekend that shows that there, oh, since October 7th, there have been 10,000, 10,000 incidents of anti-Semitism. And, some, and those include violence, they include vandalism, they include verbal and written harassment against Jews of all ages in the United States since October 7th, the highest level recorded since 1979 when the ADL started recording this, you know, multifold, hundreds and hundreds of percent increases over the previous, same period over, in, over the previous year. My, so, you know, there's this moment here uh, over the past year, there've been so many of these moments, right? We live not far from Columbia University. So we see these protests and quasi pogroms around uh, certain parts of Manhattan. We have a lot of friends who are Orthodox Jews who've been harassed, who live in areas like Brooklyn, but there was the so there's it's hard to pick which is the one that's most crystallizing. But to me, the one that was most crystallizing was on a New York City subway, and you may have seen the video. Um, oh, where I did. Yeah, these, yeah, these pro Hamas protesters get on the get on the uh, subway, and they before the subway doors close, they announce the subway is, car is packed, and they announce they said, "If you are a Zionist, raise your hand." If you are a Zionist, raise your hand. Now, the image of people coming onto a subway in the city with the largest Jewish community in the world outside of Israel and declaring that if you are a Zionist, raise your hand. And then they said, this is your last chance to get out. So raise your hand and get out of the train. This is your last chance. What does that mean? What if you don't get out? And I watched that video, Hugh, like 100 times. We had our kids watch it because what was so eerie about it is not only that nobody raised their hand, because I don't believe there were no Jews on that train, but no one raised their hands, but that the non-Jews were all just sort of minding their own business, looking the other way uncomfortably, just wanted to get on with it. And there was that sense of indifference, that sense of, like I said, that disconnectedness. You know, you, you look throughout history when there are major spikes in anti-Semitism, and you wonder why they happen, in part, they happen because everyone else is just kind of minding their own business and wants nothing to do with it. And I watched that video so many times and I thought to myself, and we talked to our kids, what should you do if you were, what would you have done had you been in the subway car? What would have been the right thing to do? There's not, there's not an easy answer, by the way. But you just, you start to realize this image I just described, how it's just become part of life now. And I don't, I, mean, I hate to say this, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. I think we are in a new world. And so I think it's that reality that our children who've lived these innocent, charmed lives as, as Jews in the greatest country in the world, America, um, are living something new now. I'm going to continue talking with Dan Senor through three more segments. Don't go anywhere, America. I got to go to radio break across the affiliates, and I'll talk to him during the breaks. We'll post it all on the podcast, play some of it tomorrow. But uh, in the meantime, I would also want to remind everyone, as we look back at that awful massacre a year ago, there is a horrific situation in North Carolina and Eastern Tennessee. Team Recon, Salvation Army, many other people are involved in the active delivery of supplies there. You can find many people to help. But it's also a good day 
to remember Hatikva, uh, the um, Hatzala, which is Michael Oren's preferred charity in Israel, if you still want to help. There's still many people displaced from their homes in Israel after a year of bombardment from Hezbollah. I'll be right back with Dan Senor. Stay tuned. I'm back with Dan Senor. Dan, we are talking about your boys. Have they internalized fear? Have they expressed fear about being a Jew in America? Um, they haven't. Ex- they haven't articulated fear. They have articulated um, a se- a- an awareness that there are people that hate us. They totally understand the lengths people will go to who hate us to express that hate. They're very aware of that, and um, and they are very aware that it's that they have to be careful. You know, who, you know, 15, 16 years old, you know, living in America. I'm asking because the most shocking thing for me about 10-7 was the utter depravity of the attackers. I, I understand terrorism. 9-11, I was on the air for eight hours, but that was 19 guys in a command structure. This was mm-hmm. thousands of people willing to slaughter children in front of their parents, parents in front of their children, carry away kidnappers, all the atrocity. Do they... Do they understand human depravity now? Yes, 100%. In fact, my my older son, and we may have talked about this at one point, my older son, my 16-year-old, last April over Passover, we were in Israel. It was their first time there since October 7th. It was my my fourth time there, I think, uh, since October 7th. But every time I go now, I do what we did with them on that trip, which is we headed down south to the Gaza envelope to those communities in the Kibbutzim in the south to the Nova Festival site. And uh, and a year before that, about the previous summer, we had gone to Eastern Europe with, uh, with my mother, as I said, who's 86, who's, and she's a survivor of the Holocaust, with my mother and my other, my other siblings and other nieces and nephews, so about 15 of us, three generations. We went with my mother to her hometown in Kosice, Slovakia, which is a small town in Slovakia where she was chased out of by the Nazis in 1944. And she was on the run. Her father was taken to Auschwitz and was murdered there. And we went with them to, to Krakow, to Auschwitz, uh, where my grandfather was killed. And it was, a, it was a roots trip in getting them to understand what had happened to our family, how our parts of our family had perished during the war. And obviously a very hard thing for teenagers to experience. And then you fast forward to last April being in Israel and touring those communities in the South. And my son at the end of that day said to me, I was asking him about the, what, what the reactions were to the day. And my son said to me, I know this is going to sound weird, but remember last summer we went to Safta as Hebrew for grandmother. He said, remember last summer we went with Safta to Eastern Europe and to Auschwitz. And I said, yes. And he said, today was harder than going to Auschwitz. And I asked him why. And he said, because as horrendous as learning about what happened in Auschwitz was, I had been, I just assumed that the world had become a different place, that 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 the world had, you know, I, I, I forget the exact words he used, but he meant reformed itself or, or had become more enlightened or civilized. And he says, and then I see what happened in Gaza, in, the, in these communities outside of Gaza, Jewish communities, and I realize it's, it's back, but it's in my lifetime now, he was saying. This is not something that happened 80 plus years before I was born. This happened in my lifetime, like not just my lifetime, like months ago. And that was very hard for him to uh, get his head around. When I come back, I'm going to talk with Dan now to extrapolate from his teenage boys to all of Israel, which is, of course, undergoing memorials all day today as it's on the brink of war with Iran. Stand by. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Dan Senor is now pretty much identified with the American Jewish community. His, His podcast, Call Me Back, is indispensable for understanding what's happened in the last year. His sister lives in Israel. His mother lives in Israel. He goes back and forth. He's written two books about Israel, including Startup Nation. 
and was very optimistic until 10-7. Now, Dan, we began with you and your boys because I wanted to now extrapolate to Israel as a whole, especially to the young men and women in the IDF and those who are three or four years behind them. How has this year changed? I'm, uh, is there iron in their soul or are they weary to the point of collapse? No, I am. Um, look, I think uh, I think about that a lot. Uh, on the one hand, Israeli society is shattered. How could you not, for all the reasons you just said earlier, the, 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 the rape, the beheading, the slaughtering of children, the taking the most vulnerable among us, elderly people, children, women, hostage now for over, now, now a year, I hate to say. Um, so, so society is shattered. And then, and then you see this celebration of that suffering of Jews, and that adds to the shattering, the celebration in many parts of the Middle East, the shattering even in corners of this country and certainly around Europe. But then you watch what's happened, Hugh, over the last few weeks. And not only what Israel has accomplished militarily in Gaza, which is extraordinary, but what Israel has accomplished in Lebanon and Iran, and specifically what it's done against Hezbollah in Lebanon, and you look at the combination of Israeli commandos, the Israeli Air Force, the Israeli intelligence, what they have pulled off. I mean, I have friends who work in, in former colleagues who work in three-letter agencies here in the United States, who work in the military and the Pentagon here in the United States. They're, they're in awe. I mean, I was, with, uh, I was with senior officials from CENTCOM, U.S. Central Command, last week. They're just... They're just literally in awe of what Israel has pulled off. Now, they would have been in awe of what Israel has pulled off in any circumstance. But when you consider the backdrop of what they've been going through this past year and what they've pulled off, um, it's, it's, it's doubly impressive. It, in 2023, Israel went through this horrendous debate, very divisive debate over judicial reform in Israel, which we, which we write about in our, in our newest book, In the Genius of Israel. And we talk about the toll that took on Israeli society. We were hopeful at the time that Israeli society would pull together. Uh, even after that divided debate, we didn't anticipate that that October seventh would be the the you know the, the trigger, if you will, for that for society coming together. But at the time, many senior uh, uh, Israelis, professionals, military professionals, people in the Air Force, people in intelligence, who were very frustrated with what the government was doing, and said, "That's it. We won't serve." We're, we won't. We won't. We're gonna. We're gonna sort of strike, if you will, from our regular training in these elite roles we play in the military. And those same people were the people who executed the pager attack against Hezbollah. These same people were the uh, people who conducted the air operation that led to the badly, badly needed demise of Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, one of the most wanted terrorists in the world. Someone responsible for not only Israeli and Jewish blood, but for, for among the worst terrorist attacks against Americans over the last couple of decades. Who pulled that off? The same people who were out on the streets protesting their government a year and a half ago. And so, Excellent point. Yes. Yeah, they have steel in their spine. I, I have one more question, which will take us in the next segment. I've come to the realization Jews can never relax. Israelis doubly can never relax. They might laugh. They might have great... I once asked Dennis... Uh, Prager, we were doing a program, why are Jews so funny? And, you know, Protestants aren't. And he had a very good answer, which is it's the only way to relieve the tension of living as a Jew. But it's been it's been a year of that. And I, I now want to ask Dan, and it will be off air, how does he react when Vice President Harris goes on 60 Minutes and casts doubt on the elected prime minister of Israel? It just seemed to me so stunning uh, on the eve of the anniversary that she would do that. Of course, I'll have former President Trump on later today. I'll ask him the same thing. But don't go anywhere, America. I'll be right back with Dan Senor, except go over to Call Me Back and, and follow it if you haven't. You will, you'll be just much smarter about all things Israel if you go to Call Me Back. And The Genius of Israel is his most recent book. I'm certain there's going to be a third book on the year after or the, the two years after or whatever it is. But Dan is going to be the guy who is best positioned to write that for all of us. He'll be back for one more segment to talk about Vice President Harris, President Trump, and, and the place of Israel in election 2024. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Stand by.
I'm back for one more segment with Dan Senor, host of Call Me Back. Dan, you heard Vice President Harris. At least you've seen the clips. They will air in full tonight on 60 Minutes of her talking about Israel and Prime Minister Netanyahu. How how did you react to those clips? Had a number of reactions to it, Hugh. I was um, it was a combination of her describing events that did not reflect real events. So I was just I was sort of shocked that a a senior U.S. official who wants to be the commander in chief of our military of the most important superpower in the world could be saying things that were so disconnected from reality. I was um, so that 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 I guess was what I was most taken aback by. For, so, for example, she kept talking about um, we need to get to a ceasefire. Where there needs to be negotiations for a ceasefire. Sure, that would be great. There's no ceasefire negotiations. Let's be honest. And there's no ceasefire negotiations because officials of her own administration say that Hamas is not serious about ceasefire negotiations. I was with one very senior official in the administration a month, three weeks ago who's very involved with the hostage negotiations. He was very clear. Prime Minister Netanyahu and the Israeli government are not the reason there's a cease, There's no ceasefire. The reason there's, a, there's no ceasefire negotiations is because Hamas is not an honest broker, is not approaching those negotiations in good faith. And so for her to respond to a question about Netanyahu and say, well, the answer is, we got, well, cool, that's wonderful. Sure, let's get to a ceasefire. There are no ceasefire negotiations because they were trying to negotiate with the terrorist organization. They tried to commit a genocide. Those are typically not the best organizations to try to negotiate with, A. B, in, the question was so ridiculous. The question kept being, do you not have influence with Netanyahu? Why can't you deal with Netanyahu? As though Prime Minister Netanyahu is the problem here. On the issues that that interviewer was referring to, those are issues that there's total consensus in Israel. It's not about Prime Minister Netanyahu. It's about Benny Gantz, who just penned an op-ed who, by the way, he and Netanyahu are bitter political enemies, and Benny Gantz just penned an op-ed for the New York Times where he lays out where all Israelis stand on Iran. And then it's also where all Israelis stand, Israelis stand on what to do about Hamas and Hezbollah, as though this is a Netanyahu problem. And lastly, Hugh, what made me really crazy was, why does the U.S., what's the U.S. interest in dealing with Iran? What she should have said is, it's not about Prime Minister Netanyahu. We, the United yes. States, have have a reason to stop Iran, which is terrorizing ships and vessels in the eastern Mediterranean, in the Red Sea, that are di- you know disrupting international trade, attacking civilian vessels. We, the United States, have an interest in stopping Iran from doing that. We, in the United States, have an interest in stopping Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. So, yes, we are allied with Israel on these issues, but we, the United States, this is not— it's not about who we have influence with or don't. It's about what, what is in U.S. interest. And last week, after Iran attacked Israel, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor in the Biden administration, went before the White House podium, at the way up, went up to the White House podium, and said there will be severe consequences for Iran. He said that, meaning the U.S. would be participating in severe consequences against Iran. Why? Why, Madam Vice President? Why, why does the U.S. think Iran deserves severe consequences? What is the U.S. interest in all of that? Did she, does she not have a view on what the U.S. interest is? Instead, she engages in this silly dialogue, completely disconnected from reality, about what one Israeli politician uh, uh, is, is doing, which I just I, – I found the whole thing actually quite alarming. Oh, it is very alarming. And when you come back next, Dan, we'll, we'll talk more about the American media and its complete collapse of objectivity, candor, uh, an attachment to facts as opposed to uh, prejudice. I do think that legacy media is very anti-Israel for reasons we can get into. But right now, I want to thank you for a half hour on what will be a very emotional and busy day for you. I look forward to listening to the new Dan Senor of Call Me Back podcast, which dropped a Memorialize 10-7, and I appreciate your friendship on the air. Thank you very much, Dan, and be safe.